I'm doing a Facebook Live right now. Okay. Yeah. So you, they just heard you. <laughs> okay, good. So that's our backup? Yeah. Got it. Yeah. It'll be recorded. Yeah. Be yeah. Yeah. For the fabulous audio of the iPhone 16 ish. Yeah. <laughs> and that's Kiyoki. There's Kai. So we have a really great showing of friends and family all here to honor Franklin. For those of you who are not here, you are here with us in virtual land. Yay! So this is on Facebook Live. So for folks who can't do Zoom, yeah. So we have a lot of fun, uh, friends and faculty and supporters of Franklin and former alumni um, here. There's Jessica. Jessica! Dave and Chan, so excited he's going to be playing for us. Gary, Mural, a lot of great folks, Rosie, good friends, Neil, Kim, hello, say hello to the Facebook Live folks who can't be here because as you know Franklin had friends everywhere and so we just want to make sure that they can feel the energy here as well.
and Dr. Tai Kalika Tengai. Tai is a professor of anthropology and ethnic studies here at UH Manoa. They're going to perform the Wailina Manoa chant, welcoming everybody to Manoa.
important to making sure that our department was secure, making sure that our equity uh, was solid, and that we had a place in the university. And because of these efforts, we can continue to strive for equality and to help create a more just future. And with that, I wanted to actually invite our dean from the College of Social Sciences to say a few words.
nao okabika, ame keoni na kane, hanao orecho hebahine, eo mai ikao la lami. Franklin married Enid, born were David and John, men, born was Rachel, a woman, answer to your proud heritage. He kupa aina o hawaii nei, poola na kapa o kaloko ia o kupa, he haumana o kela ma kainaki a mi Harvey a mi Princeton, koho ia, puliki a kapahana moku ia oe, he kama o ka aina. Eo mai, kao kahea anu mai. A native born of Hawaii Nei, raised along the shores of Kuopa Fish Pond, an outstanding student of Clayton Key, Harvard, and Princeton, you were chosen. Great Papahana Moku embraced you as a child of the land. Answer to your calling. He kumo ao, o kumo o lalo, o na koe kepa ni, no mo ika ai na kepa ni, a me a me ika. He kumo ao, o kumo o lalo, o na koe kepa ni, a scholar of the history of the people of Japan and Japanese Americans, a scholar of the history of the Japanese Americans in Hawaii, plantation workers and harvesters of king, you opened the pathway of enlightenment. You laid a solid foundation. Answer to your accomplishments. O wiki kai loa a kui aku, wa au hawaii ke o nino ne ma mama mama, ala neo ma ma noa, ha alele oi i wakine kona, me ko ike papa lua, ko obele i na ala ho, i na poe, o a kia a me pakipika no ho i ia ma amika. E ia ho, o Franklin Shoichiro Oro. You traveled on a distant sea and returned. Hawaii was enlightened with your contributions. Comfortable that the Ethnic Studies Department at the University of Hawaii Manoa was secure, you left for Washington, D.C. With your visionary insights, you opened new pathways for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders at the Smithsonian Institution and the Library of Congress. Here indeed is Franklin Shoichiro Oro. Answer to your name. The old life, the E ola mau, e ola na ibi. May you live a long life, long live your generations. E ola na ibi. E ola. Must be a logical way. 
way to marshal these disparate forces. And he has five resources to hire someone to organize alumni to wage battle. Or alternatively, have one or two students do this by doing a research project on social movements in the ES program in its early stages. Good luck, Franklin. The emails and the texts were my last communications with Franklin, but our connection as mentor to junior college and uncle to a younger member of the Ethics Studies Ohana lives on. When I received the news of his passing, multiple emails came from colleagues within Asian American Studies. I was on my way to a long way and sorry needed first Ohana vacation since COVID during my sabbatical. I was stunned and in denial, and I was unable to respond. Over the past year, I thought about Franklin and his family and all that we experienced together. I'm glad that we are all able this evening to gather to share our fond memories and honor our dear friend. Thank you, Mary, so much for organizing this. Thank you, all of those who supported you in this, our Ethnic Studies Ohana. Mahalo to the Odin family for taking the journey to help us uh, be able to celebrate and honor the dad. Mahalo to all of you who have come. Um, Aloha. I first met Franklin when I was young, outgoing acting director of what was then the Ethnic Studies program from September 74 to 77. I was around three months up high with my daughter Rosie and our faculty personnel committee was interviewing candidates for the first permanent, full-time, tenure-track director. After a fall 1976 program review, the administration had recommended that the program be phased out, and so yet again, the faculty, the students, the community, and support from alumni, and critically from uh, every city of alumni in Iowa U 142, and at the legislature, Brian, <laughs> and Roy, um, we demanded that ethnic studies become permanent and not phased out. The administration waited and hired an interim director, Dr. Miriam Nimi Sharma, until we could advertise nationally for a full-time tenure track full professor as director for the program. We had excellent candidates from within the university, but we were quite surprised and impressed when someone of Franklin's stature applied. A local boy, born and raised at Kuopal Fish Pond, where his family farmed and raised ducks, a kind of key grad, educated at Princeton and Harvard, an activist, the director of Asian American Studies at California State at Long Beach, and the co-author of the primary text in Asian American Studies at the time, Roots, an Asian American Reader. Wow, he turned out to be the perfect choice. Yet he was so kind and humble when we met him. He kindly and thoughtfully asked me, Navigado, and I um, how we were preparing for our first baby. And when he got back, he wrote a card, no email back then, <laughs> to our, and addressed it to our yet unborn daughter. Um, I know I saved it, but some are deep in the chest. <laughs> As director, Franklin had the experience, vision, connections, determination, and aloha to elevate the program into a department offering a Bachelor of Arts degree. Up until then, students designed their ethnic studies degree through liberal studies. Franklin worked with the former ES lab leaders and supporters from the legislature and within the university to increase the number of full-time tenure-track faculty positions to enable the program to evolve into a department. Most of the then part-time faculty, such as myself, were at different stages of our own PhD studies. We competed in the national searches for the full-time positions and were hired as all the dissertations. Among the faculty, lab leaders, and students, Franklin helped cultivate a culture of mutual support and aloha, hosting the gatherings at his home, finding the resources for faculty travel to national conferences, and involving faculty in research grants. He attracted funding to create opportunities for students to do internships. He worked with the legislators to fully fund the Department of Ethnic Studies. Franklin and Edith became the equivalent of godparents to Dean and my daughter Rosie, now an associate professor of oceanography here at the Regional Moor. He mentored me through my um, evolution from a graduate student to a full-time professor, I mean a full professor. 
He helped me navigate the University of Hawaii system and the twists and turns of an academic career while still serving as an advocate for my Native Hawaiian communities. He was a good friend, a best friend, and he always had my back. After 19 years as director and professor of the Department of Health Studies, Franklin became the first director of the Asian Pacific American Program at the Smithsonian Institution from 1977 to 2010. He built that program from the ground up. In 2000, when I had my first grad, Franklin invited me to be the inaugural scholar in residence in that program. It was extraordinary. While there, I researched the Brooks Expedition to Hawaii and the Pacific. The artifacts they collected had become the, the core of the Smithsonian Museum collection. I also researched the congressional recognition of Native Hawaiians in the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act and the Admission Act. Frank had also worked with me to network and gave the foundation for a 2002 Kaho'olawe rebirth of a sacred Hawaiian island exhibit at the Smithsonian Castle. My favorite memory of Brian was celebrated Hanami, the Japanese tradition of sipping sake and enjoying a picnic while viewing the cherry blossoms. The staff, including Rosie, who was visiting me at the time, packed a small picnic to view the exquisite Potomac Basin cherry blossoms with springtime wine. I still have that photo over at my desk in my office. Throughout his years at the Smithsonian and then at the Library of Congress, working with the National Park Service and at Amherst and the Association for Asian Indian Studies, Franklin always found a way to include a spotlight on Native Hawaiians and Hawaii. And as I referred to above, he kept in touch with the department faculty and the standing of the department, which he helped found. He always is and remains a keiki okahana. Franklin's spirit remains indomitable. I can't believe that I won't run into him here or in Washington, D.C. or at a conference. Halia Aloha Franklin, very fond memories always. Love and aloha to Eden, Rachel, David, and John. Aloha. Books and um, articles. 
circumstances, etc. But uh, the book that I think, <coughs> in my judgment, <coughs> is this masterpiece is uh, the book No Sword to Glory. Uh, this, I think, researchers about Hawaii should read this book to be able to understand the experience of not only the Japanese, but the entire community uh, in Hawaii. I think this is an important work and puts them at a level of scholarship that, uh, in my judgment, no other one in Hawaii has been able to do. Uh, that's my uh, uh, assessment of this work. I really uh, was uh, very impressed by this kind of work. The other thing is that uh, his, uh, he was, as I mentioned uh, in other uh, presentations, that he was a genius in terms of connectivity, <coughs> connecting with people and so forth. To the extent that he was able to put ethnic studies not in terms of the imaginary, but also on the ground, uh, to put it at a place that allowed us, after he left uh, for uh, the continent, uh, put us uh, in a position to be able to develop the, the, the program of ethnic studies to become a department, a degree granting department, and not only a certificate uh, granting uh, program. And that was an important thing so that we uh, have, have been able since uh, to uh, really uh, participate in the life of Hawaii. And as in uh, one of the uh, writings I have is that the ethnic study story is the story of Hawaii's people. And so Franklin has an, uh, in, uh, his legacy is that he left an imprint that cannot be removed at all uh, in terms of the story of Hawaii's people. So ethnic studies came out of the struggle of Hawaii's people, and therefore it is vibrant and active up till now. And so that's why I think like if any university wants to really move forward in terms of its impact in the community, it has to support ethnic studies in a huge way. And we rely on all of you to do so, and that will be the best celebration of Franklin Odo's life. Mahalo Duvalo. Next, we'd like to call up Bill Kaneko. He's a former lab leader here in the Ethnic Studies Department under Frank Minotto. He's now an attorney and civil rights leader. Bill? Thank you. You know, looking at the program, I think I'm probably the only non-PhD person on the program, so I'm a regular person. Um, but thank you for the Odo family for letting me share some of my thoughts. Um, I just want to share a little bit about my journey with Franklin. Uh, I met him in 1980 when I was at uh, the University of Hawaii and took his class, ES2000. And after my parents uh, paid probably the most expensive high school education to get in Hawaii from the <laughs> school, I knew nothing about the Japanese American internment. And that was very typical, I think, of many, many students, not only in Hawaii, but throughout the country. And so taking Franklin's course in 1980, it just opened up a whole world of awareness for me. And as you know, the Ethnic Studies teaching format is a very proactive, activism, socially based approach to learning. And so what Franklin did as a student, and later I became one of his lab leaders, is that he brought in a lot of guest speakers. And 
to share about Hawaii's history. And there are two um, speakers that really had a huge impact on me in addition to Franklin's course. Uh, one was Wally Fujiyama. Wally Fujiyama was a lawyer uh, in Hawaii, created his own firm, Fujiyama Dr. Fujiyama. And he shared his story about being number one on top of his class at the University of Cincinnati, coming home and not being able to get a job with the Good Sills and the Carl Smiths and the, uh, and the local Holly firms that were in power for decades. And so he, you know, basically formed his own uh, firm, Fujiyama Duffy, and then went on to be a very, very successful lawyer as an example of how you know, local persons can really make it into white bucking the system. And the other actually is um, Professor Noel Kent. And I remember Noel uh, for a very fiery lecture. <laughs> <laughs> and that really lit a fire uh, under me uh, as a young student in terms of the kind of social activism that ethnic studies um, embody. And through Franklin, Franklin's class, um, I remember going to Chinatown and doing tours of going on Chinatown and going up to the second and third floors. You know, as a young kid, you always wonder, like, you know, <laughs> what's up there? But we were able to go in and, and really understand the plight of, you know, um, the underprivileged and the underserved and the poor uh, in Hawaii first, uh, in first hand. But again, that whole experience was extremely profound to me. It really changed my perspective as a local person on the realities of growing up in Hawaii and as well as the injustices. Because too often, you know, we just kind of gloss over that and we're not aware of that. But by ethnic studies, that really did apply. I then transferred um, to the University of Puget Sound uh, to finish up my undergraduate studies. And I took Franklin's teachings and support and uh, at this tiny little college in Tacoma, Washington, we had the first day of remembrance ceremony at UPS. And if you go back there and remember as a student, we actually planted a, a cherry tree uh, that was a you know, kind of Kind of small little tree there. Now it's this huge thing. We're very old. Um, but again, the, the, the student body and the institution itself uh, was touched by their remembrance, you know, as a result of Franklin. After graduating in Tacoma from UPS, I went down to Los Angeles. And again, the fire that bred uh, really and that awareness of, of Japanese American internment really got me involved in the Japanese American citizens. Uh, JCL is a human and civil rights organization during that time in the, in the mid 80s. Uh, we were right in the midst of the redress bill. When Congress was deliberating the ultimate passage of the Civil Liberties Act of 1988 that provided redress for Japanese Americans during World War II. So I had literally a, a, a front row seat and watching all of the things that Franklin had taught uh, the internment and the justices being remedied uh, through Congress. I then returned back to Hawaii and then reconnected uh, with Franklin and became active with the Honolulu JCO and Allison Nikita Kisaka and I were part of this young punks and progressives of the JCO that to find issues like same-sex marriages and federal recognition for Native Hawaiians, uh, the Bruce and Mashta and the Marine Corps case, all the time that Franklin was on the board and you know, mentoring us and, and supporting us and being a part of the board. And then, as you know, as um, Diana had mentioned, uh, Franklin uh, took an appointment as director of Asian Pacific uh, programs at the Smithsonian Institute which is really an incredible uh, position for him as a scholar uh, and as an educator to be able to go to Washington. And interestingly, uh, I also then decided to go to law school. 
in Washington, D.C., so we are able to connect periodically. <clears throat> he had stayed in, in, at the Smithsonian, I think, for some 11 years, and, but I went back to Hawaii to start my private practice. And even though I went in kind of the corporate side, representing corporate clients, Franklin's voice has always remained. And in many respects, it created a somewhat of a conflict for me every day dealing with some of my business clients. Um, because, you know, as you know, there's a lot of um, companies who come and go in Hawaii, they parachute in, they do their thing, and they split. Right? Not a good thing. And I would get in, uh, into um, not disputes, uh, but some heavy discussions about the need to give back to the community. And that kind of value base that Franklin, you know, instilled in all of us, that if you're gonna live and um, engage in Hawaii, that there is a sense of a, a, a need to be responsible, whether it's a student or an individual or a company, but responsible to Hawaii. And that has always, for the past 25 years, been firm. Until today, I mean, I am telling my folks that you can't just come in and take. You have to give. And that's that's the kind of you know, value base that Franklin had always instilled in me. <clears throat> and really, the last chapter in uh, my engagement with Franklin was uh, finishing up this book that I was writing on the unlawful eviction of Japanese Americans during World War II. It's a very little known story. Most of uh, you know about the internment on the U.S. mainland with some 110,000 Japanese Americans interned, uh, 2,000 in Hawaii, on, in Honolulu, and in San Island. But there are some 1,500 Japanese Americans who were evicted from their homes in 23 geographic sites. So, after literally 25 years of research and writing, uh, starting in law school, I finally put a manuscript together and who would be the best person to be the editor of my manuscript, Keep Trying to Know it. So literally, during the past, last four or five months of his life, I was able to reconnect. And what a treat to be able to reconnect with your mentor on a lifelong project. Mm -hmm. So the book is almost done. Uh, there's a documentary <clears throat> that actually you know, has been launched. It's dedicated to Franklin Odo. Mm -hmm. um, and I urge, urge you to see it, but it, it, it was such a treat to be able to have a snippet on uh, discussion about uh, ethnic studies in Franklin, uh, briefly in the film, but have it uh, dedicated to him. So in many respects, in working with him, past four months um, was really a, a, a sheer treat um, in terms of his encouragement, his support, his critique, uh, as you know, has always been very kind and supportive. It's not, you should be doing this or that. He had a way of guiding you in a way that was very, very, very sensitive and sincere um, and very helpful. So I know that all of us have been touched in many, many ways um, as, the, you know, as students, as mentors, as friends. And I think the, the thing that you know, the, this program, uh, in terms of the write-up, I mean, for all of us, he was a scholar, a teacher, a mentor, and a friend. And I think that will always uh, be not only within me, but I'm sure all of us for the rest of our lives. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Next, we'd like to call to the microphone Kukulani Keoho Kawole. She was a SOGI fellow in ethnic studies at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. back in 2004. And she worked under Franklin in the Asian Pacific American program at the Smithsonian. Kukulani.
asked to be here to share a little bit about my experience with Dr. Odo and to celebrate this great person with all of you. Um, so in 2004, I was a sophomore here at UH studying ethnic studies. And I still remember it was a late afternoon and I was right downstairs doing my service learning part-time assistant job. Because, you know, as students, you always got to have a little bit of part-time hustle on the side. Um, I was working for Dr. Bula, a passenger at the time. And I was editing the service learning page on the website when the then chair, Dean Adegado, uh, came and he said, hey, there's this thing, this SOGI fellowship, um, internship at the Smithsonian, and the deadline has already passed. <laughs> Why are you telling me about this? Um, but we haven't had anybody apply, and it's fully covered, and you're going to get to go to DC for a semester. What do you think? And I'm this, you know, came from Castle Girl, from Kanye right? Like, first in my family to go to college. I'm like, DC, are you crazy? Like, no way. But he convinced me. So I applied and I got to go. A month later, I was flying to Washington, D.C. Um, and my internship was under Dr. Odo at the APA program. I had no idea what to expect. Very nervous, first time living away from my family. But Dr. Odo and his wife welcomed me and the other interns into the family of expatriates from Hawaii, hosted us, fed us, and made us feel right at home. It was actually very ironic handing over our boxes of Hawaiian Post chocolate at the end of that <laughs> Dr. Oda was also handing us chocolate Hawaiian Post at the end But right away, Dr. Oda's smile and his rascal jokes and laughter and his way of navigating through the museum were charming and inspiring. In our office, he had staff and interns from Japan, Philippines, Vietnam, Hawaii, and Minnesota. And he had a way of really audaciously poking fun at all of us equally, mm -hmm. um, while also making us feel really welcome. I was personally raised by a Japanese and Okinawan family, so Dr. Oda was kind of my dad away from home. <laughs> One of my fun memories of Dr. Oda that I've, I've never forgotten, and I still teach my kids, is he would ask me to help label envelopes for a mail out. <laughs> so there I was, stuffing and labeling these envelopes, I'm bored as hell, just stuffing these envelopes. And I've been doing it for a while, and he walked in. And he looks at what I'm doing, he's like, <laughs> he says, hey, if you're going to be doing something like this, you better work your brain while you're at it. <laughs> and he goes and gets a VHS tape and shoves it in the VCR, plays some documentary, and that was also very boring. But <laughs> 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 and I was so irritated, like, I'm not going to my brain to work, I just want to stuff in the notes. But that was, no, I've never forgotten that. I still teach my kids that, that lesson to this day. <laughs> and that, I feel like that's very Dr. Odo, just always keeping our brains always pushing for critical thinking. One of the things I appreciated a lot about Dr. Odo was his real cool, easy way of saying hard things. Talking about racism or injustice with us seemed to come just as easily to him as talking about the weather. Where my Hawaii up upbringing had somewhat instilled in me this aversion to hard conversations, Dr. Odo taught me to lean in and speak the truth with courage. Working with him at the museum inspired me to write a paper that semester that I entitled Buddha Heads in the Museum, the erasure of Hawaii Japanese from the Smithsonian internment camp in Um His gunbare attitude and his advocacy on behalf of AJAs in Hawaii got me fired up and excited about elevating these lesser known stories in a broader way. And that's how I remember him, lighthearted but full of fire, passionate and kind, and always up to good trouble. <laughs> Today I teach and run a consulting business helping organizations to reflect deeply on their practices and to center justice and equity in their work. It takes courage, it takes hard conversations, it takes critical thinking and making good trouble. And that started from my grounding here in ethnic studies and I have Dr. Odo to thank for being a model of that in practice for me. As students it's one thing to learn through study and it's another thing to see it lived outside of academia and the real world. And for this girl from hometown Kaneohe to see his impact taught me that someone from Hawaii could make a larger impact on the world. It's clear to people in this room all the lives that he touched and the people he inspired. And his legacy, his legacy lives on in all of his former students like me and the many more to be impacted by his memory. I can see the night pride coming through and the rainbow warrior pride as well. Next, we're going to ask 
Dr. Gail Nomura to come up. She's a very good friend of Franklin, past president of the Association for Asian American Studies from 1995 to 1997. Franklin also served as president of the AAAS from 1989 to 1991. Gail has traveled here from Washington State to join us today. Gail?
And then he thought of a way, he strategized a way to help that person. So I think in this realm, everybody can come up with that kind of idea. And he was also very personal, uh, fun-loving, <laughs> and some weeks of rascal. <laughs> it was Franklin. So he, he's not good in two shoes, and he can hard when he wanted to be. Uh, but most of us just remember so many instances where he just helped us personally and then help the heal. Now, uh, Dini talked about the last email. To the very end, he was writing emails. And we had visited him in Amherst a couple of times, uh, and my husband will follow up, skip the part where I mentioned something about my husband Steve, who will be coming up last. Uh, clean up better. <coughs> clean get up better. <laughs> um, but um, in his last email to me, I knew that his health was failing, but we, it was, we were hoping that some miracle uh, would happen and that he would be with us longer. We couldn't lose him. And yet, he was still able to answer those emails. And I told him again, I needed to tell him, uh, thank you for the sport over our whole career, uh, for the field, and so forth. <laughs> he couldn't write very much. He simply wrote, I'm glad I could be of help. <laughs> so Franklin was always ready to help. Uh, he will be missed, but he continues to inspire us to act now for justice for all. Now, some of you were talking about that little voice, these, something <coughs> ringing in here you can hear and I'm telling you. And that's something like in ethnic studies we talk about, that little voice of truth that we should be adhering to. Because he had a really strong moral compass. And I think that that ethnic studies part of it can instill in all of us. So I often ask uh, my classes, what is that little voice of truth whispering in your ear? And I think all in our audience will say, that little whispering voice is, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, get something done. And um, I'm really thankful for that little voice of truth coming from Franklin. So we would say, Mahalo to Franklin. And a big mahalo to Enid, David, Jonathan, and Rachel for sharing Franklin with us. Mahalo. Next, we're going to hear from Dr. Stephen Sumida, who just happens to be Gail's husband, as she was referring to earlier. He's another old friend of Franklin. He served as president of the Association for Asian American Studies from 1999 to 2000. Stephen, thank you so much for flying in today to help us remember Franklin. The microphone is yours now. Thank 
characteristic of him, but he was doing that. And I resented him for it. <laughs> 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 but, you know, true confession. <laughs> Give me a little more truth. <laughs> or not to appear right now. <laughs> and he would say, uh, said, but of course, this all came out of right between me and me when at the hotel bar after his martinis together. Oh, he loved his martinis. Yeah. <laughs> as much as I did back then. But I quit. Oh, I think he could too. <laughs> and Franklin, therefore, is laughing his head off right now. And I have recent experience to tell you that he is here. No problem about that. He is here, and he's laughing his head off about my telling you this about him. And I'm going to tell you about one of the last things he told me, and it was about his career. And I don't know if I even had a chance to tell David this Last November, he came to visit us, Gil and me, in Seattle, and stayed for dinner. And uh, when, when David was at a conference in, in, in town at that time. And that is, why is it that Franklin ended his career for what, seven, eight years at a small college in Massachusetts? Why did he choose to end up just teaching there? And this to me is pretty remarkable because I'm an alumnus of Amherst College. And it has to do with the fact that in the program so far, and I'm the last speaker in this part of the program, the name Amherst has come up twice. Once just now from Gail and once from a previous speaker. That's it. You don't know what he was, his work was and why he was at Amherst College. I think David knows. In June, he spent a day with, uh, at the Amherst College reunion, my reunion, with Enid. And we talked about this. It was full affirmation of what I'm about to say. And that is, in one of the several times that he invited me to speak at my alma mater, because he had enlisted me for seven, eight years to be a supporter of his in his great efforts to establish an Asian American Studies major and a, a program in American Studies at Amherst College. And uh, uh, so I've gone to speak, uh, sponsored by him several times. And this, I, I realized uh, what it was in he told me, when we drove up, he drove me to the inn where I was staying. And when he stopped the car, we had a talk. It was a talk that only two guys of our generation, he being several years older than me, however, could say to each other. No one else in the world could have said this. And he started off by saying, you know, you know, I'm a graduate of Princeton. I've been to the Ivies. I studied at other places too. I know Harvard, I know Yale, I know Columbia. He said, but I think it's true. The best college is Amherst College. I said, yeah, that's what we used to think. <laughs> that's what they told us. <laughs> and and, and uh, uh, he said, I, I'll tell you why. He said, I don't mean the faculty or administration or institution. He said, it's because of the excellence of the students. And because the college is such that it promotes and fosters and nourishes and grows the excellence of the students that they have admitted to Amherst College. And I said, okay, you know something? I believe that too. Because I'm a graduate of Amherst College. I know what it was. I knew what you know, other people were doing as undergraduates at Harvard and how they couldn't even ever meet the famous professors of that institution because those professors were always gone someplace else, either speaking or just kind of, you know, doing their thing. But he said at Amherst, the faculty are there for the students because the students are so damn excellent. And uh, that is what he was fulfilling. And I realized that 
you know, in his career, after all, when was the last time before Amherst that he actually taught his own courses with students? It was you guys, ethnic studies here. That was it. Then he spent years, decades, away from teaching. And he wanted to go back to it, to fulfill his career. It was really something. And I have to tell you, in his teaching at Amherst College, the guy was like, uh, uh, the word, I'm maybe using it wrong, but I know this word, huabai, the Hawaiian word, huabai, water war. He had a lot of water wars. Hawaii, UH, uh, ethnic studies, water board. Smithsonian water board. Now Amherst College water board. And he kept them separate. They're connected because, they're, because of him and his life. But he kept them separate. He told and taught the Amherst College students very, very little about his work at UH. About well, thought about Hawaii because it's a subject matter that he chose to teach them. Okay, but about his work, his career, he told them very little about Smithsonian. Okay, and so they had to learn about Asian American studies from him in the way that that Franklin considered Amherst way, and that is, hey, don't depend on me as a professor. What do you think, and how, and why? Okay. What do you think? It was like education and academics in a present moment. What is on your mind? And so they would come up with the topics and the subjects, mm -hmm. and he would foster them, he would nurse them, he would grow them the way everybody has been saying. Individually, each of them, and in this way, he built up a following, incredible following. I am the Amherst College alumnus, the oldest guy in the Amherst Asian Alumni Association Network who can report now or tomorrow to them about this gathering. You see, they don't know. They don't know about this. I sent them the Hawaii Herald article on him, and they said, we have no idea. You know, it's just, it's just, they had very little idea of what the history of Asian Pacific American studies was. He could say a name like Ronald Takaki, and they would say, what? Who? <laughs> you know? Uh, Franklin Oro? Oh, yeah, that, that's Franklin Oro. And they just assumed that he had been a teaching professor all his career. No question about it. Okay. Uh, they knew nothing of his backgrounds. Steve Sumida here, and Asian American literature. Mm. Is there such a thing as this literature? You know? <laughs> and I loved it. Because then, I was there in a classroom to be able to say anything I wanted. And they had to buy it. <laughs> no, honestly, it, it was a very, it, you think it's an unusual situation when it was Franklin's way. And you cannot believe the following that he has there among the other students. And they will be surprised and extremely pleased to hear me report on this, to try to bring together again what Amherst um, Franklin had left them to go figure out on their own after he's gone. But I'm telling you, he's not gone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
1997 until 2010. Several of his former colleagues from the Smithsonian Institution recorded a few remarks about Franklin, and we're going to share them with you now via, via video. Right, Nicholas? Yes. Got it. Thumbs up. Fantastic. Stand by.
Hi, I'm David Gonzalez, and I'm curator at the National Museum of American History. And I am curious to be here with you. I'm Lawrence Wigley Davis. I am curator at the Smithsonian of the Asian Pacific American Center. So the two of us are very happy to be able to share our thoughts about our, our good friend and mentor and colleague, Franklin Odo. And what I wanted to do is to share something that's been influential to me, and so much of Franklin's work has been influential to me. First, as a graduate student, I read Roots um, as a student at uh, SF State, um, when I was getting my master's there, and then later at UC Irvine, when I was get, getting my PhD. But right up to the very end, um, you know, he publishes this book in 2013, Voices from the King Field. And it's such a lovely book. For those of you who haven't had a chance to check it out, um, uh, it, it analyzes the lyrics of 200 Holy Bushi these folk songs on the Japanese plantation experience in Hawaii. Um, and what's wonderful about it is that the English translations kind of, some of them feel like Franklin's voice. So it, it must have been a lot of fun for him. I just imagine him uh, providing the context and imagine what life was like, but also imagine some of the context. And so here's here's one stanza, and I, I swear to God, you can't hear Franklin's voice, I don't know what you're hearing, but listen to this. Who is this dull character White bearded old geezer, letting all these people suffer so. You can hear Franklin's voice. It's, it's totally there. Um, and, and the one that, I, that really strikes me is, is something that evokes him as a teacher and a mentor and, um, and, and someone who was very careful and conscientious about what it meant to be a, a colleague. Um, this is a couple of stanzas that uh, for me really bear the stamp of who Franklin is. Uh, and it will be for the rest of my life. Um, so here we go. The cherry tree we planted blossoms in both hands, which is the plum, which is the cherry. Transplanted like seedlings, now in full flower, bearing fruit. I hope that the seeds that Franklin has planted continues to bear so much fruit for us. That's the job, I think, for all of us who remain in his wake. So I, I, I tried to do my best to kind of listen to him, and then they came 
out in their rituals made it possible for them to come out in 2017. They were wonderful. It was great to have them. They came out again in 2019 for the next festival. It was wonderful. And tried to work to rebuild that relationship and kind of earn their trust and apologize and listen. And they worked so hard to be appreciative and to be part of that community. Um, so this year, there was set to be a festival um, in August that ended up being canceled. And I heard, uh, I got a call out of the one day from Wing Tech, um, who's part of the English, and, and he said, Lawrence, I need to talk to you because I wanted to see if you're okay, and I wanted to say full support for you and the team. Um, I'm so sorry the festival's not happy. Um, working with the Smithsonian is great, it's fine, but you're the one we have the relationship with. You're the one we're committed to. We stand with you and always we want to work with you. We don't want to do anything to jeopardize that. And that was so powerful and moving to me. And I saw that it was Wing Tech. I feel like looking back now, it was Wing Tech. And this is really weird if somehow Wing Tech shows up to this or hears this. I'm sorry, I hope I'm not. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't love but oh, don't hopefully this honors you and, and, and how kind and careful you've been and thoughtful. And I see Wing Tech was not just talking to me, but friend and talking back to the words that gave, Franklin gave me to speak. And that Franklin gave us both the language to be more caring and patient and to trust each other and to build something. Um, and, and that, I feel like, is probably a story that I imagine people who know Franklin, that that brand is very true, that they have a similar moment or many moments of that kind of work where he didn't take any credit and he was very quiet and he was careful with our own egos and, and where we were in our lives, but gently taught us that we are part of a bigger thing, and we have responsibilities, and to, to, to kind of really care about each other as human beings. And I, I really treasure that. I know I'm way over two minutes, so sorry. Um, but <laughs> much love to all of you, and, and, and my love to Franklin's family, and to his memory, and I will do my part to keep that memory and help to see a lot of
Now I'd like to introduce David Holmes, uh, Frank Lewis on the son, David. He's going to come up here now with uh, a message from his mom. Try to read the message from my mother. <clears throat> Aloha from Amherst, Massachusetts. It was early fall of 1963. I had just ordered a bus that would take me from my university in Mitaka, Japan, to a train station where I would take a train to Tokyo. As I began walking down the bus aisle, I bumped into this guy who was crouched down, feeling his way along the floor. <laughs> Speaking Japanese, I asked him if I could help. He looked up, and out of his mouth came this very distinct American English. <laughs> no thanks, but be careful. One of my contact lenses popped up. <laughs> <laughs> that is how a 23-year-old Frank Lenoto and me Nineteen-year-old Enid Reed met, mm. and what turned out to be a very short time, we began our, our incredible journey of fifty-eight years. Seventeen of those fifty-eight years were lived here in Hawaii. Our three children, David, Rachel, and Jonathan, spent many hours on this campus, running in and out of early ethnic studies offices, and that swimming practices at the university. Franklin held our children close to his heart, and with pride and respect, watched them navigate their many pathways. See, Rich, I wanted to change this. Watched them navigate the many pathways they took to adulthood. As each of the children married, our family expanded. Tommaso, Jamie, and Krista added joy to his life and continue to bring joy to mine. Rachel and Jonathan are the parents of Emma and Max and Ben and Beth. Franklin spent as much time as work and geography allowed doting on our grandchildren. Franklin was my love, my partner, and my best friend. Our work and the times in which we lived provided many opportunities for big debates, but our shared values were the glue that created a strong foundation. We had a great variety of adventures, including extensive travel, cooking together, entertaining friends, gardening, hiking, fishing, and kayaking were among our favorite activities. My family and I have received many different kinds of support that have helped us work our way into this new stage of life. They and I are humbled by the outpouring of love and appreciative of all the kindness. Along with you, I celebrate that wonderful guy who never found that contact lens, <laughs> but somehow developed a new set of lenses that helped him and us see and work in this world with some new perspectives. Aloha, Yenoda. Here's the new director of the UH Center for Oral History, Dr. Mary Kumi Yulaniko, to tell us all about that. Mary.
before I met him. Um, Dave and I became friends through a mutual friend, and then one day I said, hey, Odo, are you related to Franklin? And he said, yeah, that's my dad. I had no idea the legacy and the impact Franklin would have, and I think today all of us celebrate him. Um, one, because of my friendship with Dave, I knew that Franklin wasn't well, um, I think as early as April. Uh, I met Dave at uh, So I messaged him, and you know, we were able to text. I was very mindful that I didn't want to exhaust him. And then I asked him, well actually, then I talked to Ty, who, uh, Tehan, who was the chair of the ethnic studies department at the time, and I said, Ty, can we do something? And Franklin gave me permission to share about his health. So we're like, yeah, we should do something. And so then I, I reached back to Franklin and said, Franklin, we really want to do something in your name. The department feels immense gratitude for everything that you've done, for our faculty, for our students, for our community, um, and your ongoing relationships with your alumni and all of us, and all the new people that you have been mentoring throughout the years. What would you like? Franklin knew we were going to because we wanted him to know while he was still alive. It was really important to us as a department to let him know that we loved him, that we cared about him, and we wanted to honor his legacy. And he said, okay, I want to support the Ethnic Studies Department, first and foremost. That's really important to me. And I said, how would you want to do that? So in the program, there are four bullet points that Franklin outlined that was really important to him. And to honor him, because of folks like Bill, he said, I want to create more like lab leadership opportunity, teaching assistance for our students. I want to really support our students. It's really important. He loved, he loved Ann Hurst, but he really loved our students. <laughs> <laughs> he also said, I want them to have hands-on experience working with faculty. We have awesome faculty members who make the time for our students who want to engage them in research, also with our community, with the activism. I want to be able to support opportunities for our students to work with our faculty members, whether it's community involvement, or whether it's scholarship, or whatever it may be. He, that was really important to him. He also, as many of you spoke earlier, was very much about bringing the outside in and taking out, out as well. He wanted to bring experts in the field to nourish our imaginations, to nourish our students and colleagues, to have this synergy of intellectual stimulation while having community engagement and activism at the same time. So that's bullet three. And finally, one of the most important things that Franklin talked about was sponsoring an alumni, faculty, student, social justice lab. He, that never left his heart. He knew that for change to happen, we had to act. And he wanted to ensure that we continue that legacy. So in his name, we're hoping that all of you here and all of you on social media land and on Zoom land could help us make his wish come true by contributing to this initiative to create an endowment in his name where we'll be able to get a rock music playing in the background. You know, Long term, we would 
love to raise about a two and a half million to have something that's really meaningful. A short term goal, one million. I think you all can help me make that happen, right? Help us make it happen. And I think, you know, thank you so much, Dave. You know, I love you lots. Rachel and John and Enid for sharing Franklin with us. And we want to do our part to ensure that we continue that legacy. So join me. Thank you.
chiming in. I'm going to lock up now. Yeah, David!